Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, Chair of the Humanities Forum, which organized tonight's event. Um, I'd like to thank you all for coming on to the live stream programs that we're offering. And if you want to see some of the upcoming programs, we now have another dozen that are coming up. And you can see that at www.commonwealthclub.org backslash online. Um, one of the first things on the website. So you can see what's upcoming. I know uh, next Monday, the March 30th, um, there's uh, the CEO of Kaiser Foundation is going to be here uh, to speak about how they're reacting to the crisis. That's at 6 o'clock. And at uh, 7.30, following that one, I'll give a lecture on minimizing fear. Um, that's my annual uh, lecture at the club. And it uh, just happened to be on this topic and seems very appropriate for the time. So uh, we'll talk about um, how we exaggerate our fears, and that doesn't help us actually solve this, the problems that we have. And it's not saying that there's no problems. It's very clear we have a problem uh, right now. And we've had lots of problems before, but we solve our problems much better when we're not too excited and too anxious about them. Um, but, but step back a little bit and pay attention. So I'll talk in more detail about that. If you have interest in that, you can just look at the uh, website and what the uh, details are. But tonight, uh, we're going to uh, interview Carolyn Winter from Stanford, and we'll start the program now. Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, Chair of the Humanities Program, which organized tonight's event, um, along with the uh, tech staff at uh, the Commonwealth Club, which is uh, putting together our online programs. And it's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Carolyn Winter, a professor at Stanford of History and American Studies, the author of American Enlightenments, uh, Pursuing Happiness in the Age of Reason, and four other books. And uh, we're going to discuss how important the ideas were that were at least among the people who influenced American culture early in American history, and we're going to talk about her other work. So, Carolyn, thanks a lot for coming, and thanks for agreeing to this online virtual event. Thanks for having me. So, uh, let's start with uh, one of your earliest books. Um, you, you did two original books, I mean, two early books, about uh, the effect of classicism on American culture and how important that was among women for 150 years or so and so on. Just tell us a little bit about those ideas and what part of, of society did it influence? Yeah, so my first two books are, or were, <laughs> uh, <laughs> about how Americans in the 18th century, which is the founding moment of the United States, were so deeply influenced by the examples of ancient Greece and ancient Rome. Mm -hmm. And, you know, from our modern vantage point today, when we have so many other uh, ways of framing knowledge, so many things that we know, we think it's so strange that people would have looked so exclusively to these two civilizations that, after all, had existed 2,000 years before mm -hmm. the founding moment of the United States. But we have to remember, uh, you know, putting ourselves in the shoes of Americans 250 years ago, that they did not have a lot of the experiences that we now have. Mm -hmm. They did not have a lot of the knowledge that we now have. Uh, the term political science, for example, had not yet been coined. Uh -huh. They were groping, grasping for examples to do the most dangerous thing that had ever been done in American history, which was to establish an independent republic in an age of empires. Mm -hmm. And they were proposing that they were going to break away from the most powerful empire in the history of the world since Rome, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which was Britain, <laughs> and that they were going to do something that sounded like a really crazy idea, which was to establish a republic based on the the views of this entity called the people. Mm -hmm. So they were looking to Greece and Rome to try to find examples of the people who had done it right. Mm -hmm. And every example in the meantime was of people who had done it wrong, like mm -hmm. the English Civil War of the mid 17th century, the Dutch Republics, these had been not very long lasting experiments in republicanism. But the infatuation with Greece and Rome in the founding era had everything to do with looking at people who were doing things right to try to figure out how Americans could do things right. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so, it, and it wasn't just men who were doing it. So I looked at a lot of men in my mm. first book, The Culture of Classicism. But then as I was doing the research for that, as so often happens, you know, yeah. the next book springs out <laughs> of the first book. I saw that they were also, uh, this was the first generation of essentially feminists, who were mm -hmm. women who were saying, well, I want some of that too. You know, I, <laughs> I want to be part of this republic. I want a political voice as well. Mm -hmm. And they found examples of women in ancient Rome, such as Portia, the wife of Brutus, right. uh, who could give them a language for talking politically when the only language that women had was to speak privately mm -hmm. uh, to one another. So there was so much going on in the 18th century, so much that, you know, I wrote two books about it, but there's 10 more books to be written <laughs> about that topic. Well, you mentioned Portia as the wife of Brutus. Um, and tell me about Abigail Adams. Uh, is, she, is she the one that you used to sign her letters, Portia? And, 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 and that's a very interesting thing. Obviously, she was married to the, to the first President Adams, right? Yes, to John right. Adams. Yeah, and the f mother of the second. That's right. right. She was quite a lady. And she, yes, and she was Portia, and she identified with Portia. Now, Brutus was the, you know, I mean, he's the one who killed Caesar, so. Yeah. Uh -huh. But, you know, well. Because he liked republics. That's right. <laughs> Caesar was seen as a threat to the Republic. Mm -hmm. He'd crossed the Rubicon, he'd come back into Rome. He was going to seize um, he was going to seize the Republic and mm -hmm. make it into an empire. And of course, this group of senators, including Brutus, saw that the, the danger had come mm -hmm. and, and that they were going to stop it by whatever means was, was necessary. But on the home front, there was a Roman matron. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how they thought of these women right. in Rome, the Roman matron. Uh, <laughs> and she was holding things up on the home front by educating her children mm -hmm to the service of Rome, educating them to think, as John F. Kennedy so memorably put it mm -hmm. in the 1960s, channeling this Roman language, mm -hmm. ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And that was the job of the Roman matron, it was not, of course, to push her own political agenda, no. but to educate her sons for Republican governance. And this is what Abigail Adams, in the persona of Portia, was doing with little John Quincy and the three other mm -hmm. Adams children uh, up there at the farm in Massachusetts. And, you know, it's interesting that the Adams marriage is, is the marriage of the, f the founding fathers uh, that we know the best. Ironically, because they were separated for so long during the American Revolution, we have over a thousand letters mm -hmm. between John and Abigail Adams. Uh, and and we, we get a kind of intimate look into their marriage. And, you know, John Adams is kind of a crusty guy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but he, he's one of these people that, that he's crusty, but, but he also just sort of lays things out really honestly. Mm -hmm. And he and Abigail have this very frank series of letters back and forth. And at a certain point in the American Revolution, when they've been separated for quite some time, John Adams, of course, doing the work of building mm -hmm. the National Republic and then writing the Constitution for the state of Massachusetts. Um, you know, Abigail's enthusiasm is flagging. Let's just say that. <laughs> <laughs> enthusiasm for single parenthood. And so he extends to her this language of civic virtue. Mm -hmm. And he says, you know, my dear Portia, mm -hmm. um, here's a bit of encouragement. And it takes her a while to get on board, but eventually she starts signing Portia as well. Mm -hmm. um, and you, for, for your viewers who really like to get into American history, the Massachusetts Historical Society has put these letters online, mm -hmm. open access. You don't have to have a paid subscription, but you can not only read the typed transcript of these letters, but you can look at a PDF of the letters themselves nice. and you can see her handwriting. handwriting yeah. Now, this is the same Adams family that Henry Adams, the writer at the end of the 19th century, comes from. He's the grandson of somebody, right? Yeah, the Adams family tree gets very big and complex, but he ultimately is one of the outer branches uh -huh. of that, which is kind of interesting, actually, about the founding era. We don't often think about this, but many of the founders died without living issue. Mm -hmm. uh, James Madison is an example of this. George Washington himself didn't right. have children of his own, but Adams was one of the founders that had a very large sort of extensive family tree. <laughs> so you're kind of saying that the founders picking Rome and Greece at the time were politically incorrect. 
pick, taking a minority view of what was going on in society and being against the empires, being against the way everything was done in Europe, or not everything, but I mean, is, is it that they, was it hard for them to persuade other uh, leaders of, of the colonial society that, that they should follow this ancient path? Yeah, well, you know, the great thing about ancient Greece and Rome is that they're, so they're not a ton of records, but there's enough records that there's something for everybody. Mm -hmm. So if you are building an empire, as Britain was, there's a language of empire there for you. And right. France was also building an empire, so was Holland. Uh, so they tap into to that language. Mm -hmm. What Americans distill out of that mm -hmm. in the revolutionary moment, actually very quickly, sort of toward the end, when they, when they go from resistance to revolution, mm -hmm is this language that they, they pull out of the larger discourse about Republican governance. And the, it does take some persuasion. As you noted with your language of political incorrectness, <laughs> classicism is a language of elites. Mm -hmm. It is something that is taught in American colleges, which serve less than 1% of the college age population at the time. So mm -hmm. it's not a lot of people, mm -hmm. uh, not like mm -hmm. today, when 40% of the college age population goes to college. It's a very right. small number. And they're, they're not shy in this age of elitism of saying that this is what trains you to be a gentleman. Right. Uh, that's what it's for, right? Um, it's the language of, of public... Um, public rule in, mm -hmm. in a way. So how do you get a bunch of other people on board? Farmers, uh, mechanics, people mm -hmm. who might not have had access. Well, you, you sort of distill the essential elements out of classicism. For example, the emphasis on farming and the farmer. Mm -hmm. One thing that we know about American life is that 90% of Americans were farmers mm -hmm. until about 1900. Mm -hmm. So, and the Romans loved farmers. They were the ones who mm -hmm. said, you know, as Cato the Elder essentially says right. early on, you know, it is in the farmer that we have the bedrock of the Republic. Mm -hmm. And uh, people like Jefferson channel that language of farming which can appeal to a very broad spectrum of society. And you can kind of take off the classical overlay. Mm -hmm. Everyone understands a farmer. Everyone understands that you have to put down the plow and take up the sword mm. to defend the Republic. Uh -huh. And that was Cincinnatus, actually, right. you know, this legendary Roman <laughs> figure, which is why we have a city called Cincinnati. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> and why the uh, Revolutionary War Veterans Society of George Washington for the veterans of the Continental mm. Army is the Society of the Cincinnati, because they're channeling mm. this Roman legend of civic virtue, of giving yourself for the Republic. But then Cincinnatus, you know, he does this important other thing, is that he doesn't keep the sword, <laughs> puts, <laughs> it, puts down, it down, yes. <laughs> turns the sword into plowshares, he's back on the farm. And George Washington symbolically does this mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. after 1783 when he steps down from the Continental Army. He returns to Mount Vernon mm -hmm. and then essentially invites a series of image spinners <laughs> <laughs> to make all kinds of busts and engravings of him being the first farmer. Right. Which is kind of interesting because George III of England was the first farmer of England. <laughs> he was also channeling the discourse of the virtuous farmer, but in the direction of monarchy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of the takeaways from this is that if you want to get your message across, whether it's in the 18th century or today, you have to pick a, a broad enough discourse with enough stuff that a lot of people can latch on to that people can kind of do what they want with it. They can mold the message for their own individual uses. So yes, classicism is very elitist in the 18th century. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't change until after the Civil War when classicism is stripped away from the American university curriculum to occupy the peripheral role. Sorry, classicism is there. <laughs> to occupy the peripheral role at the edge of the curriculum that it does today, whereas before right. it had this, this central role. Um, but, but that's why this discourse of elites can be made to appeal to people who had never heard of Brutus and mm -hmm. Portia and Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you mentioned that both George Washington and George III went with the image of the farmer. George, the name actually means farmer. Um, I happen to know that since my name is George. Um, 
and, and uh, it was a popular name for a long time, disappeared about five years after I was born um, as a popular name. But everyone who's named George thinks that Prince George is going to help us make a comeback. Okay. Yeah. So we'll wait for that. We'll wait for that. Exactly. Yeah. There'll be more farmers <laughs> uh, that either run countries or become presidents. So um, the next uh, section of, of your work, uh, the next book, was on the network of Ben Franklin and his letters. And, and I found that very fascinating. How did you come up with the idea of studying that? Because it seemed like a very unusual thing to study. And also, how easy was it to trace that network? Because it, it's, uh, it's almost like tracing, you know, somebody... Somebody gets uh, a virus, and then somebody has to trace where he went and where you, you know, who he talked to and all that kind of stuff. So you're, you're really trying to track down uh, a very hard thing to do 250 years later. So yeah. How did you go about doing that? And I yeah. think you had a team. Uh, there was a team of you did that? Right. Yeah. So this was a project that emerged out of Stanford mm -hmm. around 2008 as part of a bigger project called Mapping the Republic of Letters. And the mm -hmm. Republic of Letters was essentially the um, European and American intellectual life between the Renaissance and about 1800. Mm -hmm. And the way we got started on it was this was this was the moment when big data hit the humanities. Mm -hmm. It was the first time when a significant number of historians and English professors and all of that had access to documents and images that were not in books, mm -hmm. kind of separated from one another, socially isolated, shall we say, <laughs> <laughs> but integrated into a broader world. Mm -hmm. And we want we we genuinely asked ourselves in an open-ended way well what can we do about that mm -hmm. and so we were looking for ways to go back to people we thought we knew really well and mm -hmm. literally who do we know better than mm -hmm. ben franklin right, right. What, the, not only one of the most famous americans in history but one of the most beloved by mm -hmm. huge sectors of of people not without controversy but but somebody that a lot of americans really look up to so what could we do to take a new, a fresh look mm -hmm. at this? And so I chose Ben Franklin because Yale University had made his papers publicly accessible, mm -hmm. not behind a firewall that you had to pay for, as mm -hmm. so many of the other founder, founding father papers are. Mm -hmm. And there's good reason why they're behind a paid firewall, because a lot of scholars have spent a lot of time and a lot of money to try to make beautiful correct editions mm -hmm. of important papers like the papers of Thomas Jefferson, for example. But Ben Franklin was open access. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but we were allowed access to the metadata, mm -hmm. uh, which is actually owned by David Packard. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, David. Like ben Franklin, <laughs> so thank you. And so we were able to uh, essentially vacuum up for our own use this incredible quantity of metadata, which is data about data. Mm -hmm. So when was this letter sent? When was it received? All of these points mm -hmm. that a computer needs to latch onto, whereas mm -hmm. a human being can absorb context, what the letter is, as we would say, about, mm -hmm. right? What is the letter about? A computer doesn't really understand very easily what something is about. Mm -hmm. It understands that it was May 3rd, eighteen for Ben Franklin, 1763, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera. So we essentially threw all of that metadata into a bunch of spreadsheets mm -hmm. with the help of many graduate students and postdocs. So I thank them. Thank you, graduate students. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and we started to crunch numbers to try to mm -hmm. figure out, you know, what does a social network look like in the 18th century? Mm -hmm. Do they even have social networks? They did not use that term. Mm -hmm. They didn't even use the term network in mm -hmm. the way that we use it today. That uh, usage did not emerge until the 20th century. Uh, but they did have what I think of. I think this is the first century of, so, of real social networks. Why do I think that? Because the 18th century, when Ben Franklin lived, was the first great age of the letter. Mm -hmm. The first, uh, the sort of the only means of long distance, permanent human communication mm -hmm. that we have. Mm -hmm. Now, there had been letters before. Mm -hmm. We have letters from the ancient world, obviously, right. but we don't have a lot. Mm -hmm. And that's because paper was scarce, et cetera, et cetera. Um, not a lot of people could read and write, mm -hmm. but also a lot of stuff has been lost. Now for the 18th century, suddenly our knowledge base begins to spike upward dramatically. Literacy levels go up 
And America has the highest literacy rates in the world by the late 18th century. And they're even, especially among women, mm -hmm. uh, America is the place where more white women can read and write than anywhere else in the world at the time. Oh. And which is, which is also interesting because today we teach reading and writing at the same time. Mm -hmm. But uh, before the eight, the, in the 18th century and before, they taught them as separate skills. So mm -hmm. many people, many more people could read than could write. Mm -hmm. So in the 18th century, those two skills begin to combine into a larger number of people. So for Ben Franklin, who is not atypical for his time period, mm -hmm. Uh, we have over 20,000 letters sent and received during the course of his long life, which extends from 1706 to 178, oh my God, no, 1790. Mm -hmm. uh, so he dies when he's 84. So that's a lot of letters. Most of them are from the second half of his life. Mm -hmm when he becomes the most famous American in the world. Mm -hmm. So famous that Louis XVI of France is jealous and puts his face <laughs> on the bottom of a chamber pot. <laughs> <laughs> so we Sounds like something, no, we won't go there. Go ahead. <laughs> you know, when you're the king of France, you can do that. Right? <laughs> so we have a lot of data for Franklin. So it's sort of like, you know, you look for the thing where the street lamp is, is brightest. Mm -hmm. and, and so we had so many letters we could only work on a small portion of them mm -hmm. not all 20,000 so that remains to be done but we could still begin to forward or to to find some interesting new um thoughts and ideas about about Franklin and how how he constructed his world who wrote to him so for example we discovered that Benjamin Franklin uh, was essentially one of the first LinkedIn's uh, of, <laughs> of modern history. And so was his wife, Deborah mm -hmm. Reed Franklin, mm -hmm. that a lot of what they were doing with their letters was opening the door for other people, especially young people in mm -hmm. a very vertical society. We mm -hmm. have a pretty horizontal society right. today. Yeah. It may not feel like it, but it is much more horizontal than the 18th century, which is a society of lords and ladies and kings and paupers. Mm -hmm. And within that hierarchy, they were using letters to open the door uh, from, for, for the have-nots to mm. become the haves. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was very interesting for how that happened. The letters also reflected how ships moved in the 18th century. Mm. So today, you know, when you sign up to take an airplane to go to London, mm -hmm. for example, it says, plane's taking off at 10, you show up at 8, you get on the plane, and you go. Mm -hmm. Well, in the 18th century, the ship would essentially stay in the dock for about four to six weeks, mm -hmm. loading things, um, people, animals, whatever, for the three to six week passage to England. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, but, and part of what they were doing was waiting for a fair wind to, to mm -hmm. take them where they needed to go. So what we found were these otherwise inexplicable clusters of letters all on one afternoon or on uh -huh. one day when suddenly you imagined that they realized that the captain had said, this afternoon is when we're <laughs> going to go, we're going now, 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 and they were loading letters onto it. <laughs> so the letters trace a different trajectory than, mm. than we would imagine uh, that they do today in our era of, of air travel and um, concentrated ports of, of entry. So it, it gave us... Um, a new look at the mechanics of, of Ben Franklin's life and, and what he used letters for and what he didn't use them for as well. Well, he was connected to some other famous people. There was another LinkedIn network in France that Voltaire seems to have been the, the, the center of because he, he corresponded with all kinds of rulers, the uh, czars and et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and, and Ben Franklin was connected to Voltaire, right? Yeah. So... Did you, did you see nodes like that? I mean, there's one here over here, and then everybody connects through them, sort of. Right. So, so, right. so who are the big connectors? Yeah. Franklin is one of these big connectors. People write to Franklin, and then Franklin puts that letter in his own letter. There's mm -hmm. no envelopes in the 18th century, so he sort of folds it inside his own letter. And right. then there's always a bunch of other stuff, too, like boxes of caterpillars and what, <laughs> <laughs> whatever. And he sends it it on as well. Mm -hmm. But then there's moments of disjuncture. So Voltaire is this really famous philosopher. As you say, he writes to kings, et cetera, et cetera. But he and Franklin don't write to each other. Uh -huh. 
And furthermore, this was a really interesting part of the Mapping the Republic of Letters project, is that one of my colleagues mapped the social network of Voltaire, who, mm. who the French will hate me for saying this, but, you know, he's the, he's the Franklin of France, right? <laughs> <laughs> they won't like that. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Um, and, and we thought, okay, so, 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 he ma so Voltaire's letter network was also mapped, and it looked totally different from mm. Franklin's. Mm -hmm. So Franklin's letter network looks like the summertime... Uh, flight pattern of United Airlines. <laughs> it goes from Philadelphia and Boston to London and Paris mm -hmm. and Holland and a couple other major centers. So it's extremely transatlantic. And we have to remember that he spent the last third of his life abroad. Right. We think of him as the archetypal American, but he spent 20 years in London and then 10 years in France. Voltaire, working, working for us, though. Working, well, originally working for the British, because right. he was British, right? Everybody is British until 1776, which right. is a massive, there's a Brexit, uh, the, first, the first Brexit. But Voltaire's was, his correspondence network was entirely confined to the continent. Mm-hmm. Except for one letter, which intrigued us. There was this lone letter uh, going from Paris to South America. And mm. I was so excited. And mm. I thought, oh, he, oh, he's writing to the Inca. You know, I had these <laughs> ideas about his exotic, you know, social network. But in fact, this was also interesting. He was writing to a guy, a French scientist, who was measuring the circumference of the Earth uh -huh. from essentially Ecuador. Right. And... That was interesting, disappointing because it wasn't an Inca, <laughs> but also interesting in the sense that you have to be really careful when you're geomapping uh, mm. a network because just because somebody is in another place doesn't mean they are of another place. Right. So uh, we had to challenge our understanding of what it meant to be cosmopolitan. Mm -hmm. If you are an American the, who only writes to other Americans, mm -hmm. uh, how cosmopolitan are you really? So we, we devised a number of, you know, data interventions to try to measure qualities about Franklin that had been unmeasurable before. Mm. Um, so, uh, you know, like... Uh, what what percentage of British Americans are in Franklin's network? You know, how mm -hmm, cosmopolitan right. is he? Uh, you know, so all kinds of ways to try to add a bit more, you know, scientific rigor, mm -hmm. if you will. I hesitate to use that term. Um, Some in, scientists won't like that. Yeah. <laughs> right. So it, it would not have met the standards <laughs> of scientists. I'll just say that right now. Reliable evidence. <laughs> That's Maybe right. not proof. <laughs> I admit it. But we were able to do some... some you know, things. So one of the things about the humanities, as you know mm -hmm. so well, is that there's just a lot we don't know, mm -hmm. right? And the further back we go in time, shockingly quickly, actually, <laughs> we lose a lot of the record of the human condition. Mm -hmm. So that by the time we're in ancient Egypt and Rome and Greece, we know almost nothing, mm -hmm. right? And even in the 18th century, we've already lost a lot. So we were able to actually... Um, enumerate our unknowns. We were able to try to develop some way mm -hmm. of figuring out how much we didn't know about the 18th century. So even though Franklin is the most famous American in the world in the 18th century, 50% of the time in his correspondence network, mm -hmm. we could not identify the date of birth of his correspondence. Mm -hmm. Just no idea. I had no idea how old they were or no yeah. idea. Yeah. None. And so you start thinking, what about people for whom we know so very little? Mm -hmm. They just slide off the human record mm -hmm. almost entirely. So thankfully, there's a whole cadre of my colleagues, social historians, who have dedicated themselves to trying to find those lost voices from other moments in time when the already ephemeral nature of the record slips because of someone's low social standing into the ether. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, uh, I, I put a, a little bit of an idea about history of why it's so valuable. It seems to me that, that you know, we, we talk about prehistory. If you go back 5,000 years, then we really have no idea what was going on. 
except for through the archaeological record. Um, and that the idea that we should start telling stories about what we're up to, that we actually keep and tell, and whether they s s became legends or the, uh, eventually the, the, the original ones, it, it seems to me that we were doing well enough that we were moving out of just survival mode. If in survival mode, you don't really care about what happened before, anything else. When you start to move out of that survival mode, you start to say, well, this is what we did, and this is how it went wrong. This is how we did, this is how it went wrong. And maybe we should start telling these stories to each other so that we, we have an idea about how to do things better. And you talk about this um, in, in saying that uh, these ideas uh, from your next, the, the book, American Enlightenment, that, that people got a different idea about how the happiness of the future of the human race should come about. And that seems to me definitely the result of believing in history, believing in learning from history and saying we can, we can do better because we can look at what we used to do and say where we've made a mistake. The other thing I found interesting about how you, how you described it was that you said uh, a lot of this, these, this form of optimism or looking ahead to the future uh, came from scientific ideas about plants and rocks and other things that were breaking down ancient prejudices that that process of eight, breaking down ancient prejudices about material things actually transferred over to politics and religion. So, uh, uh, yeah. fascinating thesis. Okay, yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, so, so you know, turning to the most recent book um, that we have sitting right here, American Enlightenments, you know, the question really there is, how do a group of people, a large group of people, suddenly change their minds you know, in the middle of the 18th century, and this was not just in the United States, but in Europe as well, in this larger movement that we know as the Enlightenment. And this is a, a group of people who, there, there are predecessors as in the modern era. They're the first group of people who said, you know, the past is great, <laughs> mm -hmm. but it's really the future that matters. The now matters. Mm -hmm. And that uh, actually the term, the, the word now uh, explodes in popularity during the Enlightenment because people are worried of what should we do now. Mm -hmm. But they also begin to look at the future in a new way. So people had always looked at the future, but they thought of it in terms of some sort of post-human afterlife, right? You mm -hmm. could call it heaven or right. met the metaphysical world or whatever. But it's the enlightenment that gives us the future that we talk about now, which is the short-term, scientifically predictable future. Mm -hmm. That it, It's the future of data gathering, data analysis, and projection, usually in the form of charts and graphs and diagrams. Uh -huh. And these are all pioneered during the 18th century. So, uh, you know, just in the last couple of weeks, we've seen a lot of graphs. Some yes. of them go up, some of them go down. They're <laughs> all alarming in their own way. But these are the children of the Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. This is the result of the conviction of the Enlightenment. And, you know, the core conviction of the Enlightenment is that human reason can make the world a better place. Mm -hmm. Human reason, not God, mm -hmm. not divine intervention in the form of miracles. Mm -hmm. Those might or might not happen, we don't know. Mm -hmm. But human reason applied to the natural world and correctly analyzed can yield a short-term future in which something new can happen. And that new thing is what you called happiness and mm -hmm. what they called happiness. Mm -hmm. So, you know, an example of this, right, is in the Declaration of Independence, in these lines that we, mm -hmm. you know, like the coins in our pockets, right? Mm -hmm. They're always on us. And so we are at pains to actually describe them. To, we, we know them, but we don't know them. And it's the same with life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These are some of the most cherished words in American history. And, and we, of course, put them into our own modern spin. Mm. Pursuit of happiness. We think of happiness as a private concern. I will be happier when I have a new pair of shoes mm. or a new car or, or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. But... In fact, in Jefferson's age, and I'm choosing Jefferson because he's the one that wrote those felicitous lines, um, happiness had this public quality to it, mm -hmm. in addition to the private one. And mm -hmm. happiness was closer to what we might call national security. Mm -hmm. That we had happiness as a nation, and they called it public happiness or social happiness. We had that kind of happiness when our leaders consulted human reason and looked at data 
from the world in mm -hmm. which we live in our and using our five senses to try to make sense of that data and to protect the polity, however defined a Republican empire, mm -hmm. from threats, mm -hmm. whether those threats were external invaders or internal, you know, civic, uh, civil war, right? Internal enemies. Mm -hmm. Public happiness and the pursuit of that happiness was going to come through the enlightened rule of enlightened leaders. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we forget that public quality of those words in the Declaration of Independence. But they're some of the most kind of profound distillations of the words of the, in, the convictions of the Enlightenment that the, the future is ours mm -hmm. now as humans, and, and we sort of, we deserve it. We are entitled mm -hmm. to, to feathering our own nests using the, the, you know, the most glorious quality that we have, which is our reason mm -hmm. and our imagination. So I wanted to write a book about those people who, you know, they said all those things, right? And we, we hear that and we think, yeah, so, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that just seems like the normal way of, of running something. But we have to remember the world that all these people were coming out of. This was a world of kings mm -hmm. and um, of popes and of authority that was based on things that had been done in the past. Mm -hmm. Papacy and monarchy, these are genealogical ways of... of um, articulating the right to power. Why should you be the king, George? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> because my father was the king, et cetera, right. et cetera. And there's the apostolic su succession of the Pope. The Enlightenment um, tears away at that justification based on the past. Mm -hmm. And instead, it, it sort of says, no, what matters is now. Mm -hmm. For our political leaders, the only thing that matters is the most recent election. And that's why the presidency of the United States is such a profound political innovation in 1789, is that they have to reimagine a powerful executive. They don't want a weak executive because mm -hmm. they're still in a world of monarchies with their big armies, right? And mm -hmm. Napoleon is yet to come with his yeah. even bigger armies. So they need a powerful executive, but they need to somehow justify that executive power on the basis of enlightenment reason. And they put that reason into the hands of the people and they say, you know, every four years, we're going to consult mm -hmm. these people here. And so there's a way in which American democracy is always renewed. It's constantly now. It's constantly modern. Mm -hmm. And we now take that for granted. Um, but compare that to the papacy or monarchies that are, you know, as the lines, the king is dead, long live the king, remind right. us that part of the justification is through this eternal line into the past. And, you know, the American Enlightenment is so vertiginous in some ways because it, it cuts the United States loose from that. It, and the little craft sets sail into this new future, you know, that we hope is going to be happy. But the only thing that is standing between us and disaster is, is reason. It's reason. Um, I think this is one of the great things about history is to let us know what the decisions were like by the people at the time, in the context of the time. Because it's easy to say that, that these people were terrible because they didn't do this correctly or they didn't do that correctly according to the way we do things now. But they were moving things away from the way it was done to the way we do it now. And it seems that each step of the way our society or our culture needed to gain enough confidence to say, yeah, that's, that's okay, we can do that without ruining our society. We can extend the vote to... Every, every male that has, uh, you know, $100,000 worth of value in their land or whatever, something like that. Well, that worked. We can extend it a little bit further. We can say a little further. And I think it's the cultural, overwhelming cultural confidence that America had after World War II mm -hmm. um, because we had succeeded where everybody else, else had failed, at least in our own minds, um, and now had 5% of the world's population, but 50% of the production going on here. Um, and I think in that heady confidence, in spite of the fact that the Cold War was scary and other things were scary, that, that finally uh, so many ancient prejudices were broken down against uh, Jews, against Catholics, against 
other groups, and then against women, and then again for racial reasons, and that now, then for LGBT reasons, that, that these things are based on the confidence of the culture to say, we can live culture our way and still tolerate all kinds of other cultures. And to me, this is a profound thing that we need for the world because we need to say, uh, we can live in this world the way we want to, even though there's all kinds of other cultures in the world that don't live the way we want to. As long as we can agree on that we can trade with each other, we can do this together, and then you know, you're gonna do things the way you've done it for thousands of years. And you know, it's, it, we're, we're a little bit like people who've given up smoking and then want everybody else to stop smoking the next day. Uh, and th these things take a long time, as you've written about, in t terms of how long it took America to go from the idea of a republic based on democracy in, in, the, seven, in the late 18th century until we finally got the vote you know, in 1920 for the women and finally you know, other things. And we're still fighting for, for uh, smaller and smaller groups. But you know, sometime the idea everybody who's an adult you know, should be able to do this equally Will, will set hold and there won't be any dis, you know, ideas about the different groups who can and can't. Although by then our children will probably be saying, why do we have to wait until we're 18? Well, that's actually a good question. <laughs> it's the enlightenment that tells us yeah. uh, that human reason doesn't fully kick in in its, <laughs> in its civic capacity until we're adults. But you know, kings and queens were ruled obviously with a regent um, <laughs> as children. So it is one of the features of the, of the enlightenment that once you say that human reason is mm -hmm. the entry ticket right. uh, to participation, you have to do, and we can kind of get into the dark side of the enlightenment here right. is you have to then begin defining people out of, out of enlightened participation. And so uh, ra modern racial hierarchies, ironically mm -hmm. are born during the enlightenment mm -hmm. um, because you say, well, okay, Everybody who has reason can vote, and but we don't want all our slaves, you know, of which there are a million, mm -hmm. it, you know, around the time of the American Revolution, and four million by the eve of the Civil War. So none of those people get to vote, and the question then is on what grounds? And the the new grounds mm -hmm. is that they lack the full capacity of of reason, like children mm -hmm. and like women, mm -hmm. blah blah blah. But, yeah. But you know, going back, well, you know, <laughs> now, so so yeah. now, so so one of the legacies then that the Enlightenment has given us is to wrestle with its contradictions. Mm -hmm. Once we've elevated reason to this pedestal, we have to 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 um, to deal with that mm -hmm. and to to come to terms with its contradictions and the new problems that it generates for mm us. You know, one of the things that the people who called themselves enlightened believed was that that there was a thing called progress. Now, Americans take this for granted today, mm -hmm. and some people get really angry with me when I point out to them that progress is a myth, mm -hmm. uh, and so is decline. Mm -hmm. uh, th they're all narratives that we place upon history, mm -hmm. but the ideal of progress, that, that it was our God-given you know, trajectory to, to move ever upward, ever forward, and that when we don't, mm -hmm. uh, it's a form of decline. That, that way, that framework for understanding history was put into place in the 18th century. Mm -hmm. And we again wrestle with it today. When times are hard, we say, well, what about the progress right. which we were promised? What <laughs> happened? And what is the opposite of progress? Is it decline? Mm -hmm. and, and when we have declined, et cetera. So we, we, we tie ourselves in new different kinds of knots. But they also said, and this is a corollary that we don't often remember, is that they thought that they were never done. Mm -hmm. that, that enlightenment was not a state that anyone could achieve. It was an ongoing process. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the book closes with a quotation from Jefferson on his deathbed, the last letter that he wrote uh, in 1826. And he said, essentially, you know, all eyes are opening to the rights of man but they're not all the way open yet. Mm -hmm. We're not there yet. And this again leaves us with this open-ended legacy of enlightenment. We never know, you know, are, are we like kids in the back of the car, right? are we there yet? Are we there yet? Yeah. Are, are we even halfway there? <laughs> yeah. And then what is the goal? What do we do when we do get there? 
The second thing I would say about the comment that you made about how, you know, it's easy to look back at people in the mm. 18th century and, and say, well, they weren't enlightened at all. Yeah. You know, they held slaves. They didn't let women vote. The, the number of atrocities committed were huge and there were more to come. Mm -hmm. But what I always say to my students is that, you know, the, the goal of the historian is not to judge. That's the role of politicians, Mm -hmm. is to look about us, and it's our role as citizens to look around ourselves and to say, this is not right. We must change this. Mm -hmm. And so I will go to the voting booth or I will run for public office because I must change this thing that is wrong in my society now. Mm -hmm. That's a very different activity than the role of the historian. The role of the historian is, is a very modest journey uh, a humble journey to go back into a time for which we have almost no data and to try to understand without judging. Mm -hmm. Because to understand, you know, as we all know mm -hmm. with one another, is far more difficult than to judge. Mm -hmm. And then try doing it with almost no data. <laughs> and, and we really, really have to be modest and careful about what we can do in the past. So I, I, you know, I counsel my students, you know, we're going to look at these documents together, we're going to look at these images together, and we're going to try to just sort of meet these other people halfway, at least, if we can, and to try to understand something when there's so many traps that await us one of the greatest ones being language itself, as, I, as we saw with the example I used of the pursuit of happiness, mm -hmm. some of the most famous words in American history that we routinely misread. Misunder misunderstand, yeah. Because words change their meanings over time. Yeah, yeah it's, it's fascinating. And I was wondering uh, when you were talking about it earlier, the, the pursuit of happiness, that phrase, which is, as we, you say, we take for granted now, uh, and we take it personally and not publicly. Um, how common does that, does that have a history? Does that go back a lot further than Jefferson? Um, and and uh, does it go back to ancient times? Or, does it, or is that perception that we can make the public happy rather than just the king happy uh, was a fairly new thing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, as you can imagine, there are versions of happiness mm -hmm. that extend into the ancient world. You sure. know, the Greeks and Romans had these ideas about contentment and mm -hmm. and um, happiness of, of various kinds. And then, of course, there's the more religious version of happiness, the happiness that awaits us in the afterlife, et cetera, the eternal happiness. But what's really new in the 18th century is to harness the concept of human happiness, a secular happiness, mm -hmm. um, to the very meaning of the polity itself that the purpose of human society, which actually itself, yeah. if we had a four hour conversation. Yeah. <laughs> we'll do that next week. <laughs> we won't. Um, uh, if we had a, a, you know, society itself is a new idea, but, but the new idea in the Declaration of Independence is that that's really the whole point of the exercise, mm -hmm. is to be happy in society together. Mm -hmm. And we erect human governance, governments, to ensure our happiness as human beings here, now, in the earthly sphere. Because we are human beings and, and we deserve that. Are you, are you saying it's not just a valley of tears? <laughs> I know that's how I, I was growing up. No. Um, one other thing I thought before we get to the Q&A. Mm -hmm. um, there's this whole uh, misunderstanding about the three-fifths rule about slaves. Mm -hmm. You know, people think, oh, they just thought of, of slaves as three-fifths of a human being, mm -hmm. whereas it was really just a political compromise between the North and the South. Maybe explain that for, for our viewers, because it, it's, it's an important thing to not misunderstand, I think, about them. I mean, they were bad enough having slaves, but the, this idea is a little bit yeah. misunderstood. Yeah. So it... it and uh, let me just say that this 30-second explanation does not substitute for the <laughs> reams of beautiful scholarship that has been written on this. But basically, yeah. it's, a, it's about the question of representation. So in a new republic, the legitimacy of the government rests on 
a majority of representation. And if the South doesn't count its slaves in the legislatures, it loses population to the North. So it's really important to count each slave as three-fifths of, quote, a person for the purposes of representation. But not as a citizen. But it, right. Yeah. But in no way did they mean that a slave was, you know, three three-fifths of a person. Now, right. this is not to say that white slave owners thought highly of their slaves. Right. They thought of them in the most degrading terms possible, but they didn't think of them in that mathematical way. That is an erroneous uh, misinterpret uh, an erroneous interpretation of that particular document. Um, so this is one of the things that historians spend a lot of time fix, fix. fixing yeah, yeah. as we go. <laughs> but, but it's you know it's easy to understand why people oh, would to, yeah. would misunderstand. misunderstand. Just like the pursuit of happiness, you always think of it as personal. The same thing. Oh, they only thought of them as three fifths of a person. Um, and it also was. I mean, the South had more population than the North at the time. Um, a lot more population, and that was and, and yeah. part of it was a slave population. So they, the Northern smaller states did not want to be dominated by the South and their slavery culture. And this right. was actually an attempt to decrease the, the effect of slavery on the new country in, in some way. So it was, a, yes. it, it was an attempt by the North to try to decrease this, this idea rather than, the, than just the opposite of how people feel about it. Or, uh, well, maybe not to decrease slavery. Uh, no, not to, decre to decrease to the decrease effect of the, of the slave culture. Uh, and of the slave power. Right. Of the, the, the power of the, uh, over the presidency, for example, right. of southern slave holders, which was not very effective because many of the first presidents were slave holders. So, yeah, uh, yeah so, you know, the, the early years of the nation were profoundly divided over this question of slavery, and the Enlightenment sort of cuts right through the middle. On mm. the one hand, saying, well, you know, slaves are people too, but they, it's not that they're three-fifths of a person, it's that they lack reason. They right. lack the full capacity for reason. If your audience wants to read a document by Thomas Jefferson on this topic, it's Query 14 of the Notes, of the State, Notes on the State of Virginia, in which he talks about the inferiority of black people, not in mathematical terms, but on the terms of the Enlightenment and reason. Now, there's a lot of uh, science fiction movies and everything who... They still talk about this when you're meeting other aliens. Do they have reason? Do they, are they, do they, are they, do they qualify for us treating them well? Since we, we, we have lots of uh, other minds on our planet that we don't treat uh, the same, and we think, of course, that animals don't have reason, that kind of thing. All right, so uh, let's go to the Q&A. Uh, thanks a lot for asking the good questions. Um, <laughs> this came a little bit early, but so it was, are you planning to talk about pursuing happiness in the age of reason? So... Um, Maybe we can go back to that again. Just a little bit on, on the public happiness. It was defined as something for the whole society to get, but it was individually experienced, basically. Yeah, that's yeah. a, I might use that line. That was beautiful. <laughs> Good. All right, that's the end of that question. <laughs> um, and, and this is uh, on the point that we were just talking about. Uh, George Washington wasn't a farmer. He was a slave owner with five properties and several hundred slaves. How do we reconcile slavery with the idea of civic duty? Yeah. So, it, it, uh, big problem. Wonderful question. George Washington uh, owned farms and uh, imagined himself as a, a, a virtuous Roman farmer. Mm -hmm. And uh, as did much of the southern slaveholding elite. Mm -hmm even though they farmed out the physical work of farming to the slaves and to their overseers. And so, but it was very important to Thomas, uh, excuse me, to George Washington to, to have a sense of self-perception as a farmer because it was in the farm that the virtue of the American Republic was believed to rest. Because mm -hmm. that's what the Romans had said, right? With right. the example of Cincinnati. So he had to make himself into the image of Cincinnati. But, and, and, you know, Thomas Jefferson does the same thing at Monticello. But one of the most extraordinary experiences is to go and visit their plantation mm -hmm. homes and uh, fields, etc. 
uh, Monticello and Mount Vernon, and you see the contradictions at work, mm -hmm. the deep, deep contradictions at the heart of a society that says, on the one hand, all men are created equal, and on the other hand, mm -hmm. There's this huge population. In some of the states, there was a slave majority, uh, South Carolina, for example. And then in the British Caribbean, it was 90% slaves. Um, th that contradiction is, is deeply, deeply woven into the very architecture of those plantation houses. So, you know, the ideal of the American farm is... It, it kind of exemplifies this contradictory nature that, yes, it's a farm. Yes, it's a slave plantation. Mm -hmm. And the founding generation sits at the very crux of that American dilemma, that American contradiction. And uh, another question that relates to the same idea. The, the right now... Um, there's a division between red and blue states, uh, at least as perceived uh, politically, even though most states, they're, they're very close to each other in terms of each state. But it also has to do with the farming base, um, you know, in the red states as, as a way of looking at life differently. Um, but that's a kind of very, very different kind of farmer and, and no longer 90% of the population, but, but under 5% of the population. So how does that continue as a set of ideas from the history. Obviously a continual with, with uh, industrialization, a continual thinning out of the population of, of yeah. people who create food for us um, and they get better and better at it, uh, which is one of the reasons they don't need as many. But still, it, there, there's a way of looking at life and organizing life which seems to be somewhat more continuous. Yeah, the, f the farm is at the very core of American self-perception. Mm -hmm. Those who labor in the earth are the chosen people of God. That's what Just Thomas. Want to make sure you know that now. <laughs> <laughs> that's what Thomas Jefferson said, <laughs> and it's chiseled into the American Capitol building. Mm -hmm. So, and those are words from a moment when ninety percent of Americans were farmers or plantation owners or lived on a farm, and now, as you say, a very small percentage of Americans are farmers. Mm -hmm. But it's sort of like classicism in the 18th century. It doesn't matter that a lot of people aren't doing it. It's the idea that mm -hmm. matters. And, you know, when you think of the way that we speak about the Midwest, mm -hmm. the heartland of the nation, why do we, why do we speak in those terms? Mm -hmm. And it all goes back to this founding moment when the farm is laden with these meanings, not only of basic productivity, mm -hmm. uh, which of course we still rely on farms for today, even though they're, we don't see them, right? Most of them, we just see that we get the stuff in the grocery store at the end <laughs> of the supply chain. Even, even under current circumstances, the <laughs> grocery right. stores are still operating. It's wonderful. Yeah. And there's an invisible farm at the, at the end of it. Right. Um, but even now that, that ideal is, is brought to our consciousness because we rest the ideal of civic virtue on it, that farmers have skin in the game. Mm -hmm. They are producing for people that they don't know mm -hmm. in a kind of fundamental act of generosity on which the Republic rests. The Republic rests on this ideal of civic virtue that you, you give more than you take. Mm -hmm. And you give to people you do not know. And you give to generations that you will never meet. Um, what better symbol of that than the farmer? And what worse symbol of that than the national debt? <laughs> well, that's for a separate conversation. <laughs> another they conversation. they had thoughts about that, too. <laughs> so, let's go to uh, uh, another question. How, does, before I say the question, uh, the person who asked the question says, my 13-year-old son is watching with me. So, shout out to the 13-year-old son. Yes. Uh, how does the mapping of the social network relate to how Americans pursued happiness? Oh, what a lovely question. Well, well, one of the ways that they pursued happiness was by writing letters to one another. <laughs> um, you know, they were... They were required to be socially distant uh, in a different way than we are uh, today. We only have letters from people who were far apart from, from one another, or actually some of them could be pretty near to one another. But it was in letters 
that people could unfurl their private selves. And actually, the idea of a private internal self really comes to fruition in the 18th century. That's why novels are invented in the mm. 18th century. Novels begin as epistolary novels, letter exchanges, right? right? And, and what makes the novel a revolutionary literary form is that it says the thoughts of Elizabeth Bennet you know, <laughs> and Jane Austen are as important as the deeds of the king, which is what ha books had been about before. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth Bennet thinks this and this about what she ate for breakfast, and this is dignified with a whole book mm -hmm. and her letters to her friends, etc. So the letter helps people to pursue happiness because it is the first major vehicle in which the self can be unrolled mm -hmm. in the presence of other people and friendships can be forged and then maintained over thousands and thousands of miles in this era of global empire building. You know, we say today, like, we live in a global world. Uh, we've lived in a global world since the 17th and 18th century and the letter mm -hmm. is the internet of that time period. And I think in our current crisis, you know, we're, we're re-experiencing the pleasures of unrolling mm -hmm. our inner selves to the people that we call friends. Mm -hmm. Because it is in other people that we, f we find our full humanity. We can be alone a lot, mm -hmm. but our friends, um, you know, they help us to pursue that private kind of happiness that is as essential as the public happiness of the Declaration of Independence. Very well said. So, um, I have two questions left and we have just enough time for them. So why did Jefferson and Adams think it was enlightening to arm their citizens? A question about the Second Amendment, I believe. Oh, yeah, I'm always careful about Second Amendment <laughs> <laughs> questions. So, yeah, you want to, um, if you don't arm your own citizens, you have to arm paid mercenaries. Mm -hmm. And the health of the Republic in the early United States is believed to rest on the self-sacrifice of every citizen. So you have to be willing to take up arms at a, as a citizen for the defense of the Republic. Your other option is to pay a bunch of people from God knows where who are professional soldiers. Switzerland. <laughs> right, or as the case in the American Revolution, the right. Hessian mercenaries right. that George III brought over from his other kingdom in Germany <laughs> to fight in, in the United States. So it's really a question, and you know, so what's wrong with the mercenary? They're professional fighting people, mm -hmm. great. Uh, but their loyalty changes depending on who's writing their paychecks. Mm -hmm. So you know, what's really so new about Republican government as conceived of during the founding era is that it rests 100% on every individual citizen. Every single person has to participate. That's what they call the people. That's why that's right at the beginning of the Constitution, because that's what's so revolutionary about that document. We, the people. There is no other authoritative entity. There is no king. There is no House of Lords. Mm. There is no hereditary aristocracy as there had been for 2,000 years. There is only the people. And if people are not, if the people are not giving of every ounce of themselves to the health of the Republic, there's a bunch of kings with their paid mercenary armies. Waiting. <laughs> Waiting. <laughs> <laughs> That's just great because it, it shows again uh, how history has been not repeated, uh, but I think as Mark Twain said, it, it rhymes. It doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. Um, but we have, uh, you know, today a bunch of questions about how much do we privatize our military you know, I'll, uh, big sections of it have been privatized for different reasons, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we keep coming back to the same idea. Should we be doing it? Should we be paying somebody to do it? Um, but we have, we have time for uh, one last question, which is really a, a great one to end this with. 
Um, would you say in the 18th century we were at least earnestly thinking about the role of reason in establishing democratic rule and living under it, when now we seem to be shying away from it? Uh -huh. Why? Oh, why are we shying why away from Why are we shying it? away from reason at this current time? That won't take more than three more hours. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so yes, in the 18th century, not only in the United States, but in Europe, they were earnestly wrestling with what, what is human reason? Mm -hmm. How do we know we have it? Where is it? When does it arrive? You know, does a baby have it? it you know, they, they really were mm -hmm. trying to probe the inner recesses of our minds and then to build societies and governments on top of that. So it, it's an extraordinary task and it was pursued with the utmost seriousness. Mm -hmm. This is the generation that coins the term human nature mm -hmm. because they are trying to understand you know, what makes us human. They also coin the term homo sapiens. Mm -hmm. What fundamentally separates us from the beasts? Mm -hmm. It's reason. 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 Um, I there are would, some beasts that might disagree with us. Yeah, well, so, so but this is a, one of those other enlightenment doors that opens up yeah. new questions. Well, so, well, now, you know, how do we know? You know, how do we know the gorillas don't have reason? How do we test for that? And if right. they do, what do we do about that, right? And so we're very concerned about the question of animal rights because the enlightenment puts that squarely on the table in, in radically new ways. So, you know, Homo sapiens is invented in the 18th century, but so is the idea of the ape as the things that are not quite homo sapiens and, right. and in what way are they different so uh, I think that we have a lot of reason today and we have a, a great commitment to reason mm -hmm. and that uh, we need to continue to speak as though it matters mm -hmm. to not only our lives and our pursuit of happiness as individuals but to the success of the very republic itself Mm -hmm. It was built on the idea and the ideal of reason. And so that's what it's built for, <laughs> right? right? So we have to keep imagining that that's what we need. So this is where I always put my plug in mm -hmm. for education. Perfect. We have to continue to speak as though education matters. Mm -hmm. That the education of young people and their reason mm -hmm. for service to the Republic is... Priority number one, we've got to, to educate young people to understand what's at stake and what they can do with their own reason. Mm -hmm. so, so I, but I, you know, I, I studied the Enlightenment because I'm an optimist. Yeah, um, yeah. So I haven't given up hope uh, that, that reason gets us into trouble, you know, in some sure. discourses. But, but it also opens these wonderful new doors of of possibility for the future. Yes, and I think uh, one of the advantages of the education system, I mean, people, I'll say something about college education too, because a lot of people are saying now it's not worth it and so on and so forth, especially if people party when they go there and stuff like that. But I, I think that this is a mistake because even the people who party half the time at, at, at college still spend the other half of their time being exposed to the history of what we're doing or some sciences or whatever that they're studying. Um, and it's now 60, 70% of the population that's being exposed. And that's why we're going to have a reason. Now, I kind of look at our society and say, when we don't behave with a basis of reason in the government or in, in any other particular part of our life, um, it should make us nostalgic for when we did do it. And as long as it's making us nostalgic, we say, oh, well, we don't really want, there's a reason why we got rid of this uh, approach to, to life. We got rid of kings. We got rid of this. It's because it, it looks like this. And we don't like this. We don't like just depending upon one person saying, I know what I'm doing and just listen to me. Because it's not very convincing. It's not very convincing. And so it seems to me as long as we get nostalgic at that time, then reason has a great future. So, Let us hope. Let's hope. <laughs> so thank you very much, uh, Carolyn. That was wonderful. Um, and so ends another event at the Commonwealth Club in its 118th year of enlightened discussion. Thank you very much for listening in.